Hey, what's up, YouTube? We are back again with another excerpt from Demetra George's Volume 2. Happy we can be here again with you. We have Matt Nolan from the Astrologers Encyclopedia again. And David David Fisher from (laughs) In the First Place. (laughs) Hello, everyone. (laughs) So let's go ahead and dive right in. I hope, I mean, I don't know if we have any viewers that would have um, been celebrating Mahashivratri, but if we do, happy Mahashivratri to everyone. I hope you had good celebrations. Um, We are starting with Chapter 80. And the title of chapter 80 is Planets and House Rulership. So this is, go ahead. I just wanted to give an introduction commentary that it's, we start seeing here, whereas before we were having more of the structural overview of the astrological chart. Here we start getting more into the intricacies again in this part of the book of how to make delineations and now we start seeing the interactions between the houses gain more, um, more, how do you say, intricacy as we explore how to connect one topic to another to create a whole image of a, for a delineation. So. Absolutely, and the you know this is going to keep growing in complexity as we move through this book, especially because this book is a continuation from Volume One, and we are looking at delineating planets in houses. So it's going to give us those formulas, like David was saying, that's ever growing in complexity. And so the reason why I'm, you know, mentioning it again is that if you want to join our study book club, we are going to be going through all the examples with each other. And so that if you're having troubles following along, or if you're really wanting to dive in a little bit deeper, we're going to, you know, suss out all of these things in that group. We're here, we're just going to give it a general overview, but we're really going to dive into the complexities and intricacies that David was talking about in our Patreon. And this book has exercises. So if you're also having difficulties diving into those exercises, we can offer that support and the whole group can compare notes and all those things. So it's good uh, growth experience. Also, if you're enjoying our content, please don't forget to like and subscribe to this channel. It really helps our content gets, you know, widespread into the YouTube community. Also comment your thoughts below if you'd like. Yeah, and just on what David was saying, like, you know, this is in our group last month, we all kind of, it was like an hour and a half into the group and we were at the very end of whatever the last chapter was we were reading. And we finally got down to doing the examples in the exact way of like, step one, this is the planet, describe the planet. Step two, this is the sign. Step three, this is the house. And then really putting it together like piece by piece, like Demetria had said. And this was like my third, fourth time reading the chapter. We'd made a video about it and then we talked about it for like an hour and a half. And then sort of suddenly we, it was like the hidden layer of it was like revealed and it was this really um, amazing experience. So there's a way where, you know, you can read this and absorb it, but it's really by talking to people, whether it's in our group or otherwise, that it really sort of comes to life. Yeah, absolutely. So again, we're just excited to be able to engage in these videos and in the Patreon with all of you because it does, you know, enlighten us. And it's the, you know, engagement is like the funnest part to me of astrology, whether it's with clients or whether it's with like fellow colleagues and astrologers. So you are invited officially to do that with us. So should we dive in? Are we ready? Mm -hmm. So this will be like the step three, um, integrating planetary rulership. So she, Demetra, goes to say that nature and condition bring about the planet's agenda by using the activities of the house in which it's located in. So we're integrating the topics of the house that the planet occupies and that in which the planet rules so and she gives us some examples of these uh combinations and she talks about how the houses that one planet rule will be the resources or the the how do you call it deposits from where the planet in another particular house will take its elements from to manifest whatever it wants to manifest in the house where it's physically present 
Yeah, like even maybe even an outlet or an inspiration in some cases too, depending on like how the influence goes. Sometimes it'll be like drawing upon that house for its resources or even um, drawing inspiration or even like a repository of that house. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. Intention. And a, a very important word is intention in astrology because we take it for granted as just like your will. But think about what it actually is. It is a pressure from within to act, isn't it? It's a tension that you have in your soul, kind of resounding as a sound calling out to a, from a, you know from a siren to a pirate or for, to a sailor. Uh, you have your soul, your intention calling out to your action, and if you don't act on it, you get pissed off or you get chaotic within yourself. So what we're talking about here is that those houses they're really also going to provide that intention for the planet in another given house uh, for action or. In other words, for it to manifest itself and its significations. Yeah. yeah intention. Like if I was going to sum up this chapter quickly, and it's a short chapter, it's only like four pages, is once we've done what was talked about in the last couple of chapters, where we can say, you know, what the planet is, the sign that it's in, the house that it's in. So in those three steps, we have, she says, the planet's agenda, what it's trying to accomplish in the native's life. And then once we know how well it's going to be able to do that, now in this chapter, we're saying, okay, so what else besides like, you know, Venus is always going to be about relationships and connections with other people, but what houses does she rule? She might also have sort of accidental responsibility for the native's money or for the native's body or for their injuries or for their career. So we can say now that we know what, let's say Venus is all about in this chart, where she's going to be sort of acting on behalf of the native, what else does she have responsibility for that she has to bring through her condition in the natal chart? And in the group, we can get more into this because it's a much deeper kind of thought process that I want to get into. But there is an analogy that people like Robert Schmidt, for instance, make to make it easier to understand uh, how the planets fall uh, in, in this category of forming a delineation. And it has to do with an, an analogy to um, language. So it has to do with verbs, it has to do with subjects, and how each of these components in the chart fall within a syntax uh, to form the delineation, and how to imagine that. Dimitri is teaching us in the book to do more of, of that phrase, to, to uh, work better with that phrase. Yeah, and just as a reminder, like most planets have two domiciles. So it's also a way where the subject is going to spread throughout the, the chart a little bit. So like mm -hmm. it's going to have influence on more than just like the Lord and its house, but potentially and in a lot of cases to other topical fields that will be brought in. Now I'm going to go through the highlights from this chapter briefly, and we're probably going to comment on more, but they might be kind of just reiterating kind of our opening because, it, you know, we kind of gave an overview already of what she's talking about. So um, just to belabor some of it in Demetra's words, I'll go through the highlighting and see where we're at. So now she's talking about if the planets as domicile lords of certain zodiacs, they're said to rule. The planets are responsible for tending to the affairs of the house in which they rule. They do so by means of the activities in the house that they're located in. At the same time, the topics of the houses they rule are the originating cause for the activities in the house that they occupy. Like so, we like we kind of already that's said. The whole, yeah, it's the whole chat. She's so good at, you know, it's there's a you can really spend a lot of time thinking about this sentence where um, so we have the idea that the planet is responsible for the houses that it rules, and that also not only will those two places being the places that it rules and the place that it is, they'll be linked, but there's sort of a direction to it where there's, and she gives an example later that we'll get to, but there's, let's say the seventh is marriages. And then let's say the planet is in the second, then the topic of the spouse will sort of flow towards and be expressed through the topic of assets and finances, something like that. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So then she goes on to say that planets provide resources to the houses that they rule as well as to the planetary occupants of those houses. Okay, so now we might be tying in other planets if they're residing in the houses. So We're the planet about the guest host relationship here. Exactly, exactly. So the planets are motivated to use the topics of the house that they occupy 
on behalf of the house topics that they rule. So you see the theme of responsibility is something that we'll highlight and go deeper into in the group because it's really prominent in the language used to describe this kind of uh, condition for a planet. Yeah, and so David and I had like a really long discussion on this the other day, the thing that I'm about to say, and, and we might go into this. I'm gonna leave it as a surprise in the Patreon group, but I'm just gonna um, hint a little bit at it here. So she's essentially talking about stelliums. So if there's multiple planets, it wouldn't have to be a stellium, but okay. So if there's multiple planets in the same house, each planet is using the topics of the house to actualize its agenda, but each is motivated by different concerns that it's obligated to. So that becomes very interesting when we are talking about stellions. Okay, and then um, she says to keep in mind that the houses that the planet rules are also affected by its condition. So then she'll give, then she gives like really good examples on that. So again, we're looking at like, uh, you know, not just dividing them out into the houses and what other Lords they might be affecting, but then also obviously their planetary condition aspects and things to that nature. You guys have the first volume of this series that Dimitra made. You have a uh, more notion of what we're talking about, but if you don't go back to the basics, because this is more advanced stuff now, like you have to really know what was in the first book to be able to work with the rest of it. That's why it's in a sequence. Yeah, exactly. Good point. Yeah, she really walks you through piece by piece by piece. We really recommend Demetra as a teacher. Her books are thorough. It comes with exercises. It's like a course in and of itself, reading her books. As those of you who have the books now, and if you don't already, like completely highly recommend it. Demetra is an amazing teacher. Um, so, okay. Last, I think this is the last highlighted paragraph before we get into a lot of chart examples for the Patreon uh, portion. So, however, the way in which these topics will turn out for each person varies. It's dependent upon the nature, the condition, the location of the planet in the natal chart. So, you know, that's kind of in conclusion. You really have to look at like what we just said, the aspect, the condition, the house that, you know, you have to kind of take it in a whole package yeah and part of what she's saying i think in this paragraph is that you know she's saying if you have um like let's say leo rising she gives the example of everyone with leo rising if we're using whole sign houses is going to have the same planets ruling each topic now if your rising sign changes and you'll have different planets but the difference if between like two leo rising charts will be the placement of each ruler of the house will be different so like the topic of children can be ruled by a planet in the 10th or by a planet in the 12th. And those would give very, very different outcomes. Yeah, that's actually, thank you for clarifying that. And that's actually a good point. Like when you're just talking to, you know, um, someone that might have like a, let's say a less of a nuanced uh, idea of what astrology is, they'll be like, you're maybe even naysayers like all Virgos are the same or all you know Scorpios mm -hmm. are the same I'm not like the other Scorpios I know or something like that it, and it's because again we're not looking at just the sun we're looking at the entirety of the planets and the right then if you get a little deeper you could say oh well you know all everyone born with a Leo rising for those two hours might be the same well not necessarily depending on the distribution of the planets and their condition right. is going to really affect and change even the the rising sign uh right. so it gets a very unique uh, uh if you don't already, if you haven't already gathered it's a very unique imprint that everybody has yeah. blueprint you have to gather these uh, factors of the chart in a very precise way and you have to know uh the way in and how you put them in order right in order to make a delineation pop to your consciousness this is what we're trying to explain here and what demetra really does wonderfully in the in these two volumes yeah and you know like you can just think that once we know as on the last couple of chapters like what this planet what the condition is what it's trying to do where it is then we can say okay the topics that it rules will be good or bad in according in accordance with the delineation that we already got for that planet um and that like i just said is going to be different for each chart Absolutely. So then on to, if we're ready, on to chapter 81, the planet's domicile lord. So now we're on step four, which is the condition and the location of the domicile lord. 
A planet's domicile lord plays a substantial role in the overall condition. It is the host who provides resources for the activities of the guest planet. Planets thus share the host's good, the host's good or bad fortune. It's the duty of the domicile lord is to see the for the well-being of its guests, to protect it, and to help it accomplish its agenda. Yeah, so that's I think kind of just taking it one step further, what I was just saying, where, you know, we can say that if this planet is in good condition, the things under its control will do well, but then there's now this added layer of, well, is this planet well taken care of in its ability to take care of the things that it has to take care of? And I'll give you guys on YouTube a little short example. Think about a responsible and an irresponsible parent. The responsible parent, whenever their child calls out, they will understand the need of the child which would be uh, resonant to the planet in that parent's or planet's domicile. So let's say the parent is Saturn, the child is a planet in Capricorn. Uh, if Saturn is able to see, the parent is able to see the child in Capricorn from a good place, they will be able to give the resources and understand the needs of the child in a way that will nurture the needs of that child properly. Thus, the person has a clear way of communicating their needs with relation to that planet ruled by Saturn and a, a good uh, channel for receiving it. A bad parent or a badly placed planet wouldn't be able to give such good uh, and understanding, comprehensive, nurturing care for a child in Capricorn if, let's say, Saturn were in Aries. Uh, yeah, yeah. Instance. like just on what David said, and you know, in my mind, there are really two ways that a host can be good or bad. One is that, is it poorly placed like let's just say again Saturn is here in Aries in the 12th it's not going to be a great host it's just not going to have anything really to give that's productive the other way is that if it's in aversion so if we have a ruler that cannot see the house that it rules then it will be more of like an absentee landlord or something like that it will be inattentive blind and sort of deaf to the needs of the planet if it can see it but it has bad condition then it can offer help but that help probably won't be useful yeah, the landlord is a much better example. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's also like, you know, I just like to just pick out the idea of responsibility. So like it's it's your duty to take care of that temple or your house, even if you're gone, right? Like even if you're gone somewhere else, you still have to hire someone to mow the lawn or make sure the heat and the water on the, all those things. So it has to do with the responsibility of your to take care of your temple. Now how you can do that. You might want to, you can see it and you might want to take care of it, but you don't have much to give or you can't see it at all. So you can't hear the callings out. You don't even know if someone's there like asking for your services essentially. So it's just the idea of the fact that a planet has to take care of their, like it has the duty or the responsibility to take care of their homes or their domiciles or their temples. And, you know, then all the factors on if it can, if it can give it, uh, you know, like if a poor person has a guest, they might be generous, but they only have so much to give. Or if a rich person has a guest, they might not even see you're at their house and they're kind of like you're on your own. So it just kind of depends um, how it can take care of it, but it does have the responsibility. So I think um, the idea of like duty or responsibility, that's a natural fact that one of the planets has to have either one Uh, temple or maybe two temples that it's responsible for no matter where it lies in the chart yeah and a lot of times what you'll find is that um like the planet can see one of its houses but not the other um so like in my chart for example and this is maybe not the best example but like mars is in aries and so therefore is blind to scorpio now mars is in its own sign so maybe not the best example but because being in because its, it's, own it's, sign, it's also beneficial but, to Scorpio. Exactly. Let's pretend that it can see Aries and can't see Scorpio. Then the house that is occupied by Scorpio and any planets in it will be less attended to by Mars. And the house that Aries occupies and any planets in Aries will be more attended to and more able to sort of fulfill the better end of their significations than otherwise. Yeah. And like, again, like David said, there's so many filters to run it through. And it's like, you have things like in Matt's case, you would have something called like in girding, or you might have um, reception or even mutual reception or things like just mitigating factors to those. And you're, you're running it through all of those filters to try to all understand. Of those are you. selection principles. Basically mm-hmm. you're running your mind around one idea, funneling it down until all of those factors culminate into an understanding of a situation as a whole. Yeah.
yeah, yeah. That's, and that's, that's what you're doing. That's, that's, that's this that's whole what... process. That's both of these mm-hmm. whole books is, you know, Venus on the one end can be really bad relationships, heartbreak on the other end. It's like sustainable, long lasting, loving relationships. When we're doing this process, we're like, okay, is it here on the spectrum? Is it here? Is it here? And like, in what distinct way? Yeah, seeing what's left after you run it through the distillation process and you have to run it through all a series of factors to see what it is that you are going to get from that yeah. uh, spectrum. And so it's, then, it's kind of, sorry, just one more little note. It's kind yeah. of funny the ways where if you skip some of the steps, you can really get it wrong. So like um, I think of of your chart also where there's, I'm not going to give like too many specifics, but there's um, Saturn is in a really good house, ruling good houses, but its ruler is just garbage. And so you would think like in, initially looking at the chart, you'd be like, wow, it's a pretty good Saturn. It's not too bad. And then Mars is just horrible. And it causes. Is you know, feel, everyone. Right. <laughs> okay. It, yeah. 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 Okay. So it's true. So you really do have to run it. You can't just like have a, a first glance. Well, if you're doing Hellenistic astrology, yeah. you probably wouldn't do like a first glance. You'd run through a few filters. Right. Okay, so um, moving on, if a domicile lord occupies a favorable house, it has more beneficial topics to offer its guests. By contrast, if a domicile lord is located in an unfavorable house, it brings topics that may challenge a guest planet to overcome adversities, which I think is a really beautiful and like nice way of putting it. Um, the nature and condition of the lord must be combined with the nature and the condition of the house. <laughs> okay, so we have already explored the role of a planet's domicile lord in the evaluation of its condition. Now we must expand to include the importance of the lord's house location. A domicile lord that is angular has more potency to act as a benefactor which I thought was interesting. I mean, obviously, angular we know is important, but I think I don't know if I've ever heard it that it is actually more susceptible to being a benefactor. Like it's actually more beneficial. I knew it was more active, going into action, more particular in the life, uh, more active in the life. But the fact that it's actually slightly more beneficial when it's in one of those houses, like that's what we call the angles good, I would suppose. And all these selection principles, like you just mentioned, uh, when they point to dignity or good dignity for the planet, they are really saying it, it can be a benefactor because they are pointing to a conscious spirit uh, that will manifest through that planet. And that has to do with the philosophy behind astrology. Um, it has to do with consciousness, light. And so whenever a planet is in great condition, be it by being in its own domicile, angular, uh, visible, direct in motion, quick, all of those things, they're going to amount for a planet that is able to do good in a person's life. And you will mostly select good significations from it. Unless, of course, the times are saying otherwise. And then you integrate transits, you integrate timing techniques and things that would otherwise say that it's not time for that planet to act as a benefactor uh, that would kind of impede it. But even so, it would tend to act as such in the transits uh, of any kind to the, for the native. Yeah, and I think what David's alluding to is not just that, you know, this is one step, like we said, all the filters to find out which part of the spectrum that it's on. That's not the end, because then we have, when is it going to happen? All the timing right. techniques, transits <laughs> and activation, things like this. So, so just, you know, pace yourself. And then, you know, Demetra also, like after the, the, um, the paragraph that I just read, she'll go in on the next page to conditions of maltreatment, conditions of bonification, and different types of mitigation for those rules. And we're going to cover all of that in the Patreon study group. Yeah. And maybe just a note is that like, if we try to take all this at once, it becomes too much, right? And so this is why this book is so good. And this is why talking about it with other people is so good because she has you do it step by step by step by step by step. Because you can't, if you don't know, have like a really good delineation of what the planet is, it doesn't matter if you know when it's going to show up because you don't know what's going to show up. And so if you don't do the really easy steps, easy, quote unquote, they're not easy. They're simple, simple steps. First, to figure out what is this planet? What is it going to do? What houses does it rule? What is the condition of its ruler? And you can come up with, it's like, you can get a very short 
an accurate sentence as Dimitri does like time and again. And it's um, it, you, like Matt, you're saying it's simple, but it's not easy yeah. because, uh, and this was last Patreon study group. That's where a lot of the epiphanies came in is I just kept being like, wait, 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 like, wait, back. wait, we're going wait, to wait, stop, yeah, pair it exactly, back, pair yeah, it back, yeah. pair it back. And, you know, a lot of people, like if you're working with Demetrius books, you'll know this. And when we do tutoring or when we do the, the study group stuff, we really notice this. And I noticed it in myself, especially in the beginning, but even now, which is um, when you have to give like a planetary grade, it's like rate it, its condition, like A through D or F or something like this, or like one through 10 or whatever. It becomes hard to pair it back into like one sentence, into one thing. And Demetra works really hard to do that with us chapter by chapter. No, we're not looking at this mitigation or that or this or that or this or that. We're actually just looking at this one factor step by step. And you really need to concentrate on the, the formula and its um, systematic I guess, um, alignment, like what to do first, what to do second, what to do third, and get a concrete, simple sentence, and then go into modify, and then go into modify, and then go into modify. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the yeah, astrologers in the, in the ancient times, they used to be mathematicians, they used to be philosophers, they used to be all the other professions that had to do with the higher knowledges of society. That's why they are so associated with the ninth house. But that implicates that they were actually creating ideas for people to understand things that they had conceptualized by observing natural phenomena. So in other words, they were accommodating their minds to natural phenomena, meaning they spent a lot of time in contemplation. They spent a lot of time familiarizing themselves and creating ways of passing on that knowledge of how the, to how the planets moved, to how the planets shone their light, to when they should appear, in which times of year, how they should appear, what's their speed, how it will vary. All of those things play a factor in their understanding of the planetary functions, even in the chart. So this is why Demetra goes at this length uh, to get people to work slowly with these factors because they come from a lot of contemplation in their roots. Uh, and so we should do that movement within our minds to be able to grasp this kind of material. Go to the real basics, feel like we're really, really, you know, basic in our knowledge about it and really just grind to get those basics integrated because they're going to make it simple. And you have to have a system that works for you. And that's what is really lovely about the Hellenistic uh, system is it really outlines like what filters to do. And you're going through all these filters and timing techniques and all this, but it leads us with a, a small like bottle of medicine that's specific to you and your chart that allows us to filter to get like a really good, strong, accurate, and very unique answer out of the chart. But it does apply that rigor from the astrologer to kind of do a systematic approach each time in order to observe like what we're really working with at the end so thank yeah. you again to me like thank yeah you. and it's like i guess my, my last point is just that the basics are really the whole thing it's like the fun flashy techniques are just basics stacked on top of each other and then like applied to a specific moment in time right it's like if you don't really know the planets if you don't really know the houses if you don't really know the signs you're not doing astrology. Um, yeah, you can get some really, yeah. And, you know, Achut, I mean, Adam Allen Boss, uh, you know, talks about aiming to hit the target, not necessarily the bullseye. And I think where that comes, like, not that we can't hit the bullseye when we apply the, all the layers, especially into like, you know, the fancy zodiacal releasing, like all those things, but it really is like, there's a point there to be made that it's you like, can't skip the steps basically. Exactly. And like whole sign, uh, applications can still give us these like really amazing answers. It doesn't have to be like a degree based with all the layers of all the things. Mm -hmm. It's like, you can still get a really solid delineation by just applying the basics and nothing else if you needed to or wanted to. So that's why we're really going through them slowly and methodically in Demetra's book. And, you know, like in my opinion that, and that's, I think why he's so popular and you know, why he's worked up a year in advance is that that will get you better results than trying to do something more advanced without having a foundation for it. Mm -hmm. um,
because then people were like, well, yeah, that's pretty close. Like maybe it's a little bit more like this, but yeah, that's like generally the gist of it. And then, you know, he can say, oh yeah, well, well, actually, if you look at this other condition, the planet's in that makes sense, you know, um, and you yeah. can narrow down, but you start broad and then narrow and then narrow and then narrow, like David was saying, and then you've eliminated all these things that the planet is not, and you can arrive at something very specific. Yeah. And if you think about it, like, you know, like medicine, like you have the plant, but to be able to identify what plant you need, where it grows and when to harvest it, you could distill it through 50 different filters to get the medicine that you need or combine it with 10 different plants to get the activation that you need out of that medicine. But you first have to know the plant in its wholeness, right. where to find it and when to harvest it in order to be able to distill it properly into the medicine that you need. So again, those big, um, those base, bigger systematic like complexities is where we're, you know, we're starting to distill it now, but is where we're focusing on just making sure we're going slow and methodical through that. So yeah, thank you, Demetra, for your book and taking us in that way and providing an example of how to do that well. Um, thank you both for being here today and all of you YouTubers for watching our little clips as we move through Demetra's work. And um, yeah, join us for the study group if you feel like diving deeper with our little community. And with that, till next time. Bye. Bye. Ciao. Oh, <laughs> <laughs>